you know, one of the unique things that we're in right now. 16 players signed, 10 of them reported in January, right? So uh, really just a very unique opportunity uh, for us to get guys in here working with them. Today was the first day uh, we had a chance to get with them on the grass. So we actually uh, had our first chance as coaches because we were out on the road in January the whole time uh, to be around these guys for the first time. It really, really was a fun day overall for that. A couple things off the field. Um, you know, I haven't really been able to say, uh, you know, one of the things in January was pretty awesome is to watch uh, some of our guys that were been here in the past have some tremendous success uh, on the football field. See Kirby get a, I don't see Kirby, see Spoon get uh, a Pro Bowl invite and all that goes into that. Um, I did talk to Sid the, the night, unfortunately, he had an injury, so to be able to talk to him a couple hours after that happened uh, and, and realize the highs and lows of what football can bring was, was, was very unique. Um, a couple shout outs, I have a couple former players uh, obviously, Nick Allegretti from here going to the Super Bowl, but Dre Greenlaw, it was kind of one of the few games I've been able to watch in its entirety. Uh, it was a playoff game two weeks ago. Dre was a kid very similar to Tanner, had zero offers other than us at the University of Arkansas, I believe. We offered about midway through his senior year, um, came in as a safety, we moved him to linebacker, and now he's playing the Super Bowl. Just a, a really cool story. Brandon Allen, another former player of mine, he's the third quarterback at, uh, at San Fran. So, Kind of a neat thing to watch all those guys uh, uh, get where they need to be. And then also uh, the five uh, five or six guys that played in bowl games. Uh, I think we have six guys now invited to the combine. Uh, just kind of check in with those guys periodically to get calls from GMs and, and, and personnel people that are at these senior bowls that are watching or interviewing our guys. I specifically got an interview while, while, an inter while a GM was interviewing or his organization was interviewing Tip Ryman. Uh, uh, they literally reached out to me and said, is this, is this as real as I feel it is? And I was like, it's even probably better than you think, right? So just, I think our guys portray themselves in a way that, that uh, makes them very valuable to that next level. So uh, obviously a couple staffing changes. Um, really kind of in January, we stayed really just focused on recruiting. There was a new recruiting rule that allowed us as coaches to go out and be on the road uh, and see kids into schools that we've never been able to do before. I've never been able to sit down with a junior. Uh, the very first day the rule was in effect for us in January, it just happened that all the schools were canceled in Illinois and I had a 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock um, all in a row at, at, at six different schools in Chicago and I could sit down with the young man and their parents uh, in the school. Um, I, was, I was, it was a timing factor that there was no school so it was kind of convenient they didn't have conflict with classes but literally got a commitment that day and I, I, when I was in that school, uh, when it was beginning to happen, I was sitting there with a young man and his parents and, and the dad said, hey, can you step out a minute, Coach B, I want to have a conversation with my family. And I'm like, oh boy, I've been through this before, but I've never been through it in, a, in January with a junior, right? Because it's been illegal to have a conversation with them in, in the school until their senior year. So uh, it's been a learning experience for everybody. I think that last week I was on the road, uh, I was in 10 different states in five days. Um, so it was just a, a little bit chaotic. So we really have focused on staffing after we've got back in uh, I've had several candidates on campus, had a couple on today, I uh, have a couple more in this weekend. My intent and goal was to have somebody up and running at, 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 at the positions by Monday. Um, I think we're on task. I expect to probably have a wide receiver coach here sooner or later uh, as we speak. And then um, inside linebacker position, I'm in a little bit of a holding pattern. I've had a couple on candidate, but there's one guy that I want to talk to that isn't available until the later part of this week. So uh, we'll handle that and process that as it comes. With that, I'll open up anything else. Any other, other questions? Why, why did you want to make a couple defensive staff changes? What, what do you hope to add? Why? Yeah. I haven't talked to you guys since then. No. <laughs> uh, um, well, uh, twofold, right? One of the things that I think really, uh, as we sat back and looked at that season, you, you get done, um, you go back and take a comprehensive look at what you did schematically, what you did uh, uh, as a result, uh, but also just have a lot of dialogue with players, coaches, and staff. And, and um, I realized where we are and where I wanted us to go. Um, uh, obviously no uh, negative, uh, you know, both the guys that uh, I relieved are, one was a former player, one was a former coach, think the world of them and their family, who they are um, and what they're going to be, but just felt we needed to have some change on that side of the ball, especially, and just, just continuity and, and, and uh, a little bit of, of everything, football, recruiting, uh, uh, administrative things in the building, just, just really felt that was necessary. I haven't made a lot of moves like that in my coaching career. I think that's seven guys over 16 years, right? So. Um, yeah, this is what it was. I uh, felt we could get an opportunity to get better and get stronger, and hopefully that's what's going to happen. What's the challenge of a coach when you have turnover with the staff, especially the last two years? Well, I think you, you, um, you know, first and foremost, it's a new person in a young kid's life, right? But um, 
literally since the first day when I came here, uh, I talked to, to the players about, hey, like if you hire good people and you you have the things that I think can happen, like you're gonna have transition. I've been fortunate enough to have, I think about seven head coaches now that have left, several coordinators, guys who won the NFL. Um, I got a call last week, two weeks ago, uh, uh, a running back coach that I used to have um, was hired into the NFL again, and, and that was, I believe he was my uh, second or third running back coach that went to the NFL over four in a row. Um, so um, I think we brace the kids for it, but also understand like one of the things that is advantageous for them, if they have a chance and a dream to go on to the next level, you literally have a league that changes coaches on a weekly or, or I'm sorry, on a, on a yearly basis and the ability to learn and, and be instructed by coaches from multiple backgrounds is a good thing. Um, but anytime you bring somebody new in the building, there's going to be a, 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 obviously a change in the way they say things, do things, preach things, and, and uh, that'll take a little bit of adjustment, but I, I don't think it's something you can't overcome. Coach, now that you got Washington and Oregon, two LA schools, does it change the way a little bit of your, recru your recruiting map? I, I get the question, and it, it obviously changes in some capacity, but yeah. I, I really believe this, right? For us at Illinois, we're going to be based on what Illinois is, right? Okay. So. We're gonna focus in the state of Illinois. Everybody has a piece of Illinois. Uh, really concentrate on some border states. I, I realize that some border states don't have a lot of prospects and they also have strong home state pro, uh, programs. So we, we, but we do recruit any border state uh, to Illinois. We've really done a lot in New Jersey and we've done a lot in Florida. Um, I would say that's a blueprint of what we are. I don't see that changing, but uh, we've dabbled into California now. Um, uh, I think based on, on, on the outcomes of my hires here over the next a uh, week or two weeks that that, that could really open the doors. Uh, I've always been intrigued with Dallas because there's a direct flight here from Dallas um, uh, to, to Illinois. Um, and, and I think that is a venue that we can explore more than ever now that we got, especially when we got kids going west uh, or families going west to, to games. So yeah, it's gonna change the dynamic at some point, but I don't think it changed a lot about what Illinois is. Bert, when we talked to you just at a press conference right after the season, it didn't sound like you were making any coaching changes. Like, did you have a sense yeah, you did. I just didn't broadcast sure. it with you guys. I, like, I don't think that would be a very... Right, I just didn't know if it was something that was more of an evaluation no, period after no. that you got this thing. I think I probably do uh, at some point, um, and, and the people involved I had those conversations with, right? Um, but I, I really wanted to take a moment and just process where I was at, where I thought we needed to go, and that's when, when I made the moves. What can David do for Aaron? And then what can he bring to your defense? What can David, uh, David Gibbs? Yeah, for Aaron and then your defense as a whole. Yeah, so, you know, Gibby and I, I don't know the whole story, if you, you know, I, I literally met him my first week on the job as a linebacker coach at the University of Iowa. Uh, myself and Bobby Elliott, God rest his soul, was no, with her, no longer with us. We went on a, 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 we took a defensive staff and we went to Kansas and Kansas State. Um, at Kansas, uh, went there, Glenn Mason was there. Um, uh, there was a guy by the name of Mike Hankwitz, who was a defense coordinator, and he had a young DB coach by the name of David Gibbs. Um, and uh, uh, then we went on from there and uh, uh, went to, to uh, Kansas State and I had a conversation with those guys, which was where the first time I ever met Venables. And like, it's just crazy the people you meet back at that time and what they've become now. Um, so Gibby and I hit it off then. Um, uh, and then he, lo and behold, obviously comes into the state of Minnesota. Uh, I don't think he was the coordinator first when he got there. I think Hank had it, and then Hank left, and then Gibby became the D coordinator. I recruited Minneapolis and South Florida, which is where Gibby recruited. So we really um, began to talk a lot of football, be around each other. Uh, when I was at the University of Iowa, when Hayden left, uh, Glenn Mason offered me a job uh, at the University of Minnesota under Gibby with the D coordinator. He and I were real close. Uh, I almost took that job, but uh, I stayed at Iowa until they named who they were going to name. That's when he named Kirk. Kirk kept me, so I never made that transition. Um, but just kind of, he and I have been around each other for a long time, never worked together, but I followed his work. Um, obviously he became the D coordinator at several different places, both Minnesota when they had a great defense uh, at, at Auburn, uh, went in the league for whatever it was, seven, eight, nine years. Um, uh, he and I had conversations about that. I had, I had an opportunity earlier in my career to uh, get a couple interviews in the NFL and really didn't pursue them hard because I just kind of listened to what he told me about that league. And, uh, so there's just a lot of things that tied into our relationship. When, when I first came here, um, actually Ryan and Gibby were together in Missouri and um, the year before I had interviewed for the head, jo head coaching job in Colorado and um, one of the coaches that interviewed there was David, was um, uh, Ryan Walters. And I was talking to Gibby, I'm like, tell me about this guy, and because I was in direct competition with him, right? And, obviously uh, didn't go that direction. Uh, so that's when I first heard about Ryan. And when I took the job here, 
uh, when I made kind of a decision, I had about five candidates and I, I, I interviewed three guys. I interviewed obviously Ryan, um, an active head coach and a guy now that's actually a coordinator in this league. And major reason why I went with Ryan was a conversation with Gibby, uh, just that he uh, was around him in certain ways that allowed him to grow. They've been together, been around each other. Um, so when transition happened a year ago and I decided to retain Ryan uh, or decided to, to uh, promote Aaron, I, I really had interviewed Antonio earlier in, the, in my career here. Like I, I followed him all the way through. I thought it'd be a nice um, a combo of those who knew each other. But, uh, you know, obviously when I made transition, I wanted to get an older voice in that room. I wanted to get someone with a little bit different perspective. Uh, and that's, that's what really Gibby was the only guy that I went after. I contacted him early on, uh, literally uh, in December kind of get a feel where he was at. He had some things moving in his yard. And then when, when I made transition, I just reached out to him and said, this is what I plan on doing, this is where I'm at. And Aaron and I flew down and met with him on several different occasions um, uh, during the recruiting periods and, and uh, 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 had a chance for those guys to visit. Um, David had known quite a few guys on our staff and, and I just thought the comfort level there after several meetings was, was pretty significant. That's why we pulled the trigger. You guys signed in December. You signed Josiah Knight and yeah. today in Mississippi State. And yeah. asked him, was it, can you walk us through what happened there? Yeah, uh, Josiah was a guy that came to us in June, um, committed to us. Um, uh, I, I know I went down there during the uh, uh, December signing period, December recruiting period. Really was excited to get him in the boat. He signed with us. Um, I always say this, right? Every day I, I, I grab a cup of coffee, walk out the door, and when I'm driving into work every day, I say, "What's going to happen today?" That I have no idea is going to happen. And um, it happened with those Josiah in 16 years. I've never had this kind of moment come up. Uh, but when it became clear to me that he was not going to be able to come here to Illinois, that's when I reached out to him. We went and saw him. I sent a couple coaches to his, uh, to him and his family and his coaches. Uh, his coach was ironically an Ira, a former Illinois player. Uh, talked to coach as well, and I said, hey, if I can't get him here to Illinois, um, I love him and his family for everything they are. Like, what can we do to help? And because he wanted to be here, there had no doubt about what he wanted to do. Um, uh, but that wasn't going to be possible, so I literally uh, told him that the best option I think he could do is to sign, I believe, with Mississippi State and, or whatever the, the best feeling he was. But I know he's a tremendous football player. Uh, there's a reason we recruited him. There's a reason I think he had over 60 offers, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, I never thought I would help an SEC team get a player, uh, but uh, I want to see what's best for him. And uh, I know there was two Big Ten schools who were messing with him, so I was kind of glad he wasn't going to be in this league. Uh, so. Uh, he's at Mississippi State and wish him the best luck. Yeah, it's a great one. So really you just learn through history, right? And, and when I was at the University of Iowa, I had a, a, a young uh, linebacker. I literally wrote a letter to him every day of his life, right, for two years. Um, his name was Aaron Campman. Um, and, and he was a... Uh, uh, a guy that came from a little town called Appleton Parkersburg that um, that little community at the University of Iowa had three NFL draft picks. Um, and Brad Meester, who was ironically the only guy that Iowa didn't go after, went to UNI and he became a first round draft pick. Um, I believe Aaron was a mid round draft pick. Casey Wiegman was maybe a second or third round pick. I played with Casey. Um, I knew how good a player he was, but then that was from the playing side. And then as a coach, I began to, you know, I go in and Aaron Campman was recruited nationally by everybody. He was our biggest competition. Um, uh, ironically, there was a guy by the name of Kyle Vandenbosch, who was, who was an Iowa kid that went to Nebraska. Um, there was a guy named Trev Alberts, who was before him, who was ironically very close to our league now. So there were some small school kids that went to Nebraska and had great success. So I was bound and determined uh, that I was gonna get Aaron Campman to say yes, right? And, and, and thankfully we did and, and I had a great like time coaching him. Uh, there was another kid by the name of Dallas Clark, who's from a small town in, in Iowa, that uh, Livermore, if I'm not mistaken, Iowa, and uh, you know he was totally under recruited. I actually got him as a walk-on. Um, couldn't get him to play linebacker, but I told Kirk, I'm like, this guy can't read a guard pole, but he's really good at running. Uh, literally, literally became the best tight end in college, you know, in in the country, first round draft pick. I think the great thing about small schools is you're usually three things: you're undersized, under recruited, and underdeveloped. And those are three things that I think you can change literally if you're in the right program. And you know, Matt Bailey was kind of our first rodeo where we really liked Matt. He came in the spring, uh, was in the middle of a track season, didn't run a great time, but I loved everything about him. He was so disappointed, and I called Matt after that night in the spring and just was compassionate to him. He was waiting on an offer. He was hoping on an offer, and we couldn't do it. Lo and behold, 
you know, five, six months later, we were able to make that call and offer them and, and, and uh, been rewarded for it ever since then, right? Um, Mac Resetich, I watched Mac, I, I remember when Pat Hamilton came in and gave me the film and I, I watched like 25, 30 plays and every one of them was a touchdown. And I'm like, I'm like, how many touchdowns does this guy have, right? And he told me the number and uh, then I sent a couple coaches to watch him play basketball again. In this conference, I realized that a lot of people watch what we do. Um, when we make moves, people use, we had a young man a couple years ago, a linebacker that had zero offers. We offered him and two weeks later, he had over 40 offers and he went to a, a blue and gold school. Uh, and so like, I just, I just know enough not to put people on the path of too much of what we believe in. So um, when, when Matt came around, that was a story. And the same thing with, with uh, Tanner now. Coach, all, all things considered, considering the season you had last year and staff changes, guys going to the draft, does spring ball take on uh, more importance this year than usual, integrating coaches and all that stuff? Zero. I think that we go into spring practice with the highest intensity humanly possible. Um, I don't think anybody that comes into our building would, would tell you there's anything, even the candidates that come through, the energy level in this building and the desire to be successful. Uh, I get the question, you got to ask it, it makes sense to you, but it makes no sense to me, right? Like. We approach every every season, every spring, every workout. I literally had a conversation with our guys today that, you know, today's workout is is you know the, the first Wednesday workout in the week three of, uh, of, or, of, of I'm sorry week four of winter conditioning. And if you just think it's another day, then you're going to be left behind. Tomorrow's got to be better than, than it was today. Uh, next Wednesday has to be five times better than it was this past Wednesday. Or, you know, it's just we will not survive with that mentality or that thought. Right. I think a lot of us expected Jim Leonard to get to get a job yeah. somewhere. Is he still on your staff? Yeah. And what's, what's, his yeah um, what's his future? So in theory he is, but we signed him with the idea that like um, if he wants to do this, then it would be open to come back to him. He and I have had a million conversations, not about the job, just like Jimmy's a guy that I just I just like bouncing things off of and where it's at. Um, don't want to get into his business, but you know, uh, I think this, if he doesn't have the things he wants at a different level or a different mm -hmm. than our level, what I was saying, if not in college, right? Like, um, I think we'll, we'll, we would be back at it. Um, I, he literally sent a report a couple weeks ago that was unbelievably detailed and, and, and great ideas and thoughts. Um, uh, I just reached out to him last night. I know he's got some irons in the fire, that's his business, but uh, um, yeah, Jimmy's been, been awesome, a very gifted coach in a lot of ways. What are your thoughts on the, the current status of signing day? Ten years ago, first Wednesday in February was yeah. everything. Now it's five percent of recruiting kind of thing. You know, yeah. Do you want to see a change? Do you want to see a shift in that? I, I want to do what's best for the game, right? And and I really do believe the way this thing has evolved, right? So it used to be this was the National Signing Day, right? And 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 uh, um, I was at the National Coaches Convention meeting in Nashville in, in early January and. Um, there was a, there's a meeting they have that has all the head coaches at it. Um, myself and Ryan Day were the only two coaches there from the Big Ten, but uh, it had a lot of coaches talking, right? And, and I, I made the assumption that everybody's signing day was like ours. It was kind of an anti-climatic. Uh, we recruit a certain type of kid. There probably aren't a lot of surprises. Obviously, you already asked about Josiah, so those things are gonna pop up. But for the most part, I pretty much went to bed that night knowing who was gonna sign tomorrow unless we were gonna get clubbed over the head of the Philly club. Like, like there was, it was gonna be what it was, right? But I think there's a lot of places that you know you're dealing with decisions that young men are making that have tremendous impact on them and their families, right? Like you can probably understand what I'm saying, right? And when you get into that world, there's some things that just. I remember Coach Fry telling me a story when he was at, uh, I think at SMU, um, they used to let coaches go out on the road and you could be present while a kid was signing, right? And and um, he talked about how. I think it was at SMU, they decided that to keep everybody from trying to steal their guys, they put them all on airplanes. And they flew them around from eight o'clock. We have touchdown in a hangar, fuel up and take off and fly them around. <laughs> like, can you imagine that, right? Like, now Coach Fry could be at the time, right? God rest him, I love him. Um, but he said that's what happened. They literally flew in and landed in a hangar at 1201 and they would all sign their scholarship papers, right? I don't think we want to go back to that. But I do think there is an element of, of recruiting that, like, once you say it, it should just be, you, you know what I mean? Like, maybe there's a grace period or whatever it is, but there's a lot of people that think, all right, like, if you're a sophomore or a junior and we offer you a scholarship, we can hand you papers. If you want to sign it, it's done, right? Um, uh, 
I remember Mike used to say that, Mike Leach. I used to, you know, be in uh, some meetings with him. Uh, I, I distinctly remember Coach Spurrier talking about it, right? And, and, and uh, I don't know if we'll ever get to that point, but there has been some coaches that proposed like a June, July signing day, which to me would make a lot of sense. But I also understand high school coaches are very much against it because they think kids will opt out of their senior years, right? So one of the first problems that creeped into college football that everybody wants to write about was guys opting out, right? Like I remember in Illinois when we went to a bowl game a year ago, they never had players opt out. Well, it had been in college football for about 10 years, but the only one never been to bowl games, so it wasn't a reality here, right? But like that part, I think, is real. I do believe if kids sign before their senior year, they probably could have a, a percentage of guys. I'm not saying it's going to be half. I'm not saying it's 25, but there might be 10, 20 percent of the most elite players in college high school football. They got their NIL deals. They got their scholarship in hand. They're just going to say peace out, right? And and. So I don't know what the happy medium is. The part I like about the June, July is that now most kids make their decisions and it would just, I think it would take a lot of pressure off them. I don't know how many coaches, I know I would say if a kid called me and said he signed with us and he's not gonna play a senior year, I said, that's ridiculous, go play, right? You get better at football by playing football. We have, like we have a young man, Tyshawn, that just literally came to us, right? And he tore his ACL this past year, right? In what, week four or five, right? And I remember them calling us, obviously coaches and alumnus as well, and they're worried I was gonna pull the plug. And I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, let us help you. Can we have the surgery here? We appealed to the NCA and tried to get him to have the surgery here. Like, we don't push him away, we pull him in, but I'm not sure everybody would operate like that. Like if I was, like there's some programs, like wait a minute, he's injured, he's got an ACL, let's go see who else I can get. So I think that's just part of the game, uh, but Robert, I wish I had a better answer. I, I do think an early signing period would help everybody, but if you could create some type of caveat that the kid's got to, I don't think you can make a kid play, but like that's the only element I don't see. And then the flip side of it would be if you sign a kid and there's a coaching change, right? Like, like we literally just had a coach leave college football to be a DC in the NFL, right? Like, like that's it. I, I know half just a somewhat bit, but like he want to do that, it's his business, but like that opens that portal for those guys for 30 days, right? Um, it's just a very interesting time. Like, I, I, you know, with my coaches, I've said it since I've got here, but it's so true. There has never been a time where recruiting your roster is, is more important than it is right now, right? So even though I'm the outside linebacker coach or I'm the O-line coach or I'm the tight ends coach, I want you to have a relationship with that kid on the other side of the ball, right? Because he may come to you in a moment of, hey, what do you think I should do, right? Um, maybe he's having an argument with his, or he's in a disagreement with his position coach, but somebody else can encourage him, right? Like. Um, I'd be straight up real, right? Like we had a number of transfers come in and those transfers out there today working out are, are, are they're focused. Now for us, you know, we're not in the Cadillac business, you know, um, but, but like, like, like those guys are working, they, they, they're detailed, they're hungry. A lot of them came from smaller schools coming up or were from a, a high level school that wasn't where they wanted to be. And every one of those guys talk about since they've come into our building, how much they see we can help them, right? Like, and, and that's what makes me happy because I know I know what we can do for those guys. Um, and we're just extremely hungry, you know? Um, I, 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 I was a little, little not down, but just the January can get tiresome, right? But to watch our guys work out, you know, my wife, I was laying down Sunday night and she's like, aren't you glad I don't have to get on a plane this week? I'm like, so excited. She's like, what time are you getting up? I said, 4.15. She's like, oh my God, right? Like. But that's what you needed. You need to come in and watch those guys work out because they just bring your juices up, man. It's a, it's a really fun time in this sport. I think NIL is awesome. I think the early signing period is awesome. I think transfer uh, uh, opportunities for guys within reason. There's some things that bother you, right? Like a kid right now can be a grad transfer and leave at any time. So in June and July, if he's graduated and he bring you bring in a freshman that might be in front of him and or, or, or something where somebody, you know, two weeks, they can literally go to your spring game. They could literally, some schools, he could go to your fall camp first first meeting and transfer to a next school, your, your opening opponent the next day. Like that's legal, like that's, that's insanity. Um, so there's some things that's gotta get reeled in.